Well, it's great to be with you this morning, uh, especially because of that extra hour, wasn't it? Oh, glorious. Um, and it's a great, great Sunday, too, because we are starting a new sermon series. Uh, our, this sermon series is uh, actually based on the book of Malachi. It's a, Malachi is a minor prophet, and he's actually the very last book of the Old Testament altogether before what we would uh, term the intertestamental silence. There's this intertestamental silence of about 400 years from when the Old Testament ends, and God breaks that silence. It's, a, it's God's silence, that intertestamental silence of 400 years. God breaks that silence with his word that becomes flesh in Jesus Christ. So, uh, but that's a whole different sermon series. Today, we're looking at Malachi, before this big silence, this uh, time. Now, of course, the sermon series is called Leaning Forward, Longing for God's Presence. And um, as we look at Malachi, I just want to recognize that uh, um, we say Malachi is the name of the prophet, and it's also the name of the book. But actually, Malachi, some scholars argue that's actually not the name of the prophet. That's more of a descriptor, because Malachi is the Hebrew word for my messenger. So we're thinking, oh, this is really a message from the Lord. Uh, so, uh, so that's what the word Malachi actually means. It may be a person's name, but, but some scholars would argue it's a descriptor, that this is a God's messenger for us. And as we look at this, uh, at this text, you'll notice that throughout the book of Malachi, it's uh, really written as a series of disputes. Actually, it's a dispute between God and God's people. As a matter of fact, it's written in such a way that it's, it's as if uh, this takes place in court with God on trial. And you'll see how God is even in our own text today. God is put on the defensive here in our text. So a fascinating text. So if you are in your life, if you are leaning forward right now to question God, leaning forward, longing for his presence in your life, then Malachi is the book for you. Uh, today, we're going to take a look at chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 5, those opening verses of Malachi. But there's a few things that you need to know in order to actually understand what we're reading. Otherwise, it may be a little confusing. So let me explain. To understand today's text, you should know that, that Jacob, you know, Jacob in the Old Testament, uh, is, is also known by what other name that he yearns? Israel. That's right. Jacob uh, because, uh, has, has the name changed to Israel when he wrestles with God. And it also refers to the Israelites. So in our text, Jacob is Israel, is the Israelites. They're kind of interchangeable there. Also in our text, uh, in the same way, Esau, who is uh, the brother of Jacob, he is also referred to in our text as Edom. And he's also known as the father of the Edomites. So in our text, when you hear the word Esau or Edom or the Edomites, we're really talking about the same, same group of people as well. So do you understand this? Do you have two groups? Uh, the terms Jacob, Israel, and the Israelites are kind of one group. Those are interchangeable words. And then the other group, Esau, Edom, Edomites are interchangeable words for the other group. Okay, so that's going to help us for our text today. So here we go. Uh, this is Malachi 1, verses 1 through 5. Let's listen to God's word for us. An oracle, the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you, Israel, you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. I have made his hill country a desolation and his heritage a desert for jackals. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down until they are called the wicked country, the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, Great is the Lord beyond the borders of Israel. Whew. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Tough text. Well, I, uh, uh, some time ago, I received an email from a dad named Scott. And uh, Scott's son, Scott's five-year-old son named Brian, he noticed that uh, mom was out. And he asked about it, so Scott explained. He said, 
Well, mommy is at a Tupperware party. <laughs> and at first, Brian was satisfied with this answer. But then he asked, Dad, <clears throat> what's a Tupperware party? Now, Scott, being good, honest, uh, uh, being, being good about being honest with his kids, uh, he gave the simplest explanation he could. And he said, well, Brian, at a Tupperware party, a bunch of ladies uh, sit around selling plastic bowls to each other. <laughs> and, and Brian nodded knowingly. And then he burst into laughter. Come on, Dad. What is it really? <laughs> It's hard to believe in Tupperware parties, especially for a five-year-old. Belief in some of these things can be really hard. Belief for the Israelites was really hard as well. The Israelites had a hard time believing that God loved them. In our text today, you can see that they lean into God's face and they accuse God and they say, God, where is your love? You say you love us? Prove it. See, this, was, this all took place around the mid-400s B.C. It's at that point that the Israelites had lost political independence. They were actually under Persian rule at this point. The Israelites faced difficult economic realities. And frankly, they wanted justice for suffering at the hands of the Edomites. See, the Edomites were supposed to be their friends, but the Edomites had betrayed the Israelites. They wanted justice. They were leaning forward into God, facing God, saying, God, do you even love us? Well, we can relate. I don't know about you, but we often lean forward <laughs> for God's loving presence, but at times God just does not seem loving or present. Maybe you've prayed hard and long, but that prayer just seems to drift into the ether. Maybe you've cried, kind of like the Israelites, maybe you've cried out, Lord, how can you do this to me? When will you bring peace to my life? Why won't you fix this? Don't you love me? At times, God's love can be harder to believe in than Tupperware parties. How can we believe God loves us? We are leaning forward, longing for his loving presence. Well, verse 2 opens with God's words, I have loved you. I have loved is actually one, one word there in Hebrew. As, as you know, this was originally written in Hebrew. And in the Hebrew language, uh, believe it or not, in Hebrew there is no past, present, or future tense, like we have in English. Of course, we have past, present, future. Hebrew, there's none of that. Instead, in Hebrew, they have, in their verbs, there's only complete or incomplete action. So no past, present, future, but just complete or incomplete, which we don't really have in English quite as like they do in Hebrew. So the translation is really difficult. So this text, the Hebrew word, the very first word of verse 2 says, Ahavti. Ahavti is translated as, I have loved for us in the English. But friends, it, this is not past tense. This is completed action. Don't you love that? It's, it's not a past and gone kind of I have loved you. No, a havti can, can best be translated as I have and I am completely loving you and I will continue to completely love you. Isn't that beautiful? Yet because the Israelites were experiencing difficulties, could they really believe a havti? It was harder to believe in God's love than in Tupperware parties. And we may lean forward, frankly, and ask the same question. How can we believe you love us, God? We want your loving presence. Where is it? But 
There is also an additional piece of our text that is, I don't know, pretty harsh, I would say. It's a difficulty for me, especially this past week as I was studying it, and maybe you noticed it as well. Did you notice? It's the beginning of verse 3. Well, in Hebrew, it's the, it's the word sane. Hebrew, Hebrew word for hate. God hates Esau. But isn't God, isn't God love? What does hate, what does sane, what does hate mean here in this text? Well, I've discovered it really has four purposes in our text, four different dimensions to this word that I think will help us. Firstly, number one, the word love of all things is ahev, and ahev, love, is used opposite the word hate, sonet, in Hebraic covenantal language. So in other words, when God says he loved Jacob and hated Esau, it actually means God chose Jacob and not Esau. It's the election language of a loving covenant. So firstly, sane is covenantal language, saying God loves Israel. Now secondly, this is language of comparison, we would say. God shows the Israelites that he cares for them, unlike Edom. God has forgiven the Israelites and brought them home in con contrast to the other nations. So secondly, this is comparison language, saying God loves Israel. Now thirdly, this is actually justice language. The word sane, hate, in Hebrew, indicates God's justice toward Esau, Edom, the Edomites. That's because of Genesis 27. The Israelites would know that text very well. In Genesis 27, it says that Esau hated Jacob. And so now God balances the scales of justice for Israel. Esau has chosen hate, and so God allows hate to be Esau's condition. You see, so thirdly, sane is justice language, saying God loves Israel. And fourthly, and I might even say most powerfully, this is language of identification. God expressing sane, hate, against Esau, Edom, is God identifying with the Israelites. God feels what they feel, suffering with them in their pain and anger and in their hate. God is with them, intimately feeling what they feel. And so fourthly, sane is identification language, <coughs> saying God loves Israel, is with Israel. This reminds me of a story about my son. This is before, before he turned two. Uh, Aiden had gotten himself into a glorious, goopy mess as, uh, you know, preschoolers and, and toddlers are apt to do. And so, you know, as a young dad, I wasn't quite sure what to do with this goopy mess that he was. And so I just set him in the bathtub to contain him as I started to, to clean things up. And Aiden started jumping up and down in this bathtub, but as you might imagine, he slipped, banging his chin on the edge of the bathtub as he went down. And he let out a painful scream and blood flowed from his chin from a terribly deep cut. I felt horrible. We, we rushed him to get stitches, and it just broke my heart to see him in such pain. So I stayed with him in the operating room as, as the medical team restrained him. He was wrapped in this sort of, um, it, was, it was like a Velcro blanket to hold him down. And he was wrapped in that blanket lying on the table, and then I was there laying with him, beside him on that table, holding him as they pushed the needle through that open gash. And Aiden 
couldn't understand why they were doing this to him. He was screaming in fear and in pain to me. He said, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And my heart was breaking for him. And I found myself holding him and whispering in his ear over and over as, as tears streamed down his face. Oh, I love you, Aiden. I love you so much. It'll be okay. I love you. I'm so sorry this is happening. I love you. I love you. I love you. And when the medical team finished up, and wrapped up their time. In that moment, I realized the tears that streamed down my face matching Aiden's tears. I was deeply in it with Aiden. I was feeling what he was feeling, loving him so deeply that our tears matched. That's why God uses that word in verse 3. Sane is God's tears matching the Israelites' tears. It's a word expressing his love for them through covenant, through comparison, through justice, and through identification. God loves Israel. But can we believe God loves us? I mean, we long for God's loving presence. Well, here's the answer to that question. And actually, the, the answer has been staring us in the face the entire time from our text. We know that God loves us because God allows us to argue and accuse and blame him. He's not angry with that. Why? Because God wants to engage us in relationship no matter how we are, no matter how he gets us. You see, God loves us even when we are unlovable. God loves us even when we reject him. God loves us even when we hate ourselves God loves us even when we think we don't need him. God loves us even when we accuse him. God loves us simply because his love is relentless. Praise God. God's relentless love drove him to the cross as Jesus Christ, thereby extending his relentless love to the world. And you know that. You know all about that. You know, it's right there, John 3, 16. If you know that text, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Friends, that's the fullest expression of God's relentless love for us. And believe it or not, that's what Malachi is all about anticipating the coming of Jesus Christ. God welcomes our complaints and accusations just as he did the Israelites in Malachi. He welcomes our complaints and accusations just so that we can be in relationship with him. That's immense proof that God loves you. In uh, C.S. Lewis's book, The Horse and His Boy, from the Chronicles of what? Narnia. In, in this series, the great lion, Aslan, is the Christ figure. Now, in this story, Shasta is a boy who has had a very difficult life, raised by a harsh fisherman who, who found Shasta when Shasta was just a baby. And at this point in the story, Shasta is on horse alone in the middle of pitch black night in such a heavy mist he can see nothing. And at this point, he is depressed, he is alone, he is exhausted, reflecting on how difficult his life has been. And during this traveling alone at night, he slowly realizes that there is a presence moving alongside him that has been there for quite a some time. And finally, he dares to break the silence. And here's what happens. Who 
are you? Shasta said, scarcely above a whisper. <laughs> One who has been waiting long for you to speak, said the thing. Its voice was not very loud, but very large and deep. I can't see you at all, said Shasta after staring very hard. Then he said almost in a scream, you're not, you're not something dead, are you? Oh, please, please do go away. What harm have I ever done you? Oh, I am the unluckiest person in the whole world. Once more he felt the warm breath of the thing on his hand and face. There, it said, that is not the breath of a ghost. Tell me your sorrows. Shafter was a little reassured by the breath, so he told how he had never known his real father or mother and had been brought up sternly by the fishermen. And then he told the story of his escape and how they were chased by lions and forced to swim for their lives and of all their dangers in Tashpon and about his night among the tombs and how the beasts howled at him out of the desert, and he told about the heat and thirst of their desert journey and, and how they were almost at their goal when another lion chased them and wounded Erebus, and also how very long it was since he had had anything to eat. I do not call you unfortunate, said the large voice. Don't you think it was bad luck? Uh, to meet so many lions, said Shasta. There was only one lion, said the voice. What on earth do you mean? I've just told you there were at least two the first night, and there was only one. But he was swift of foot. How do you know? I was the lion. And Shasta gaped with open mouth and said nothing. The voice continued, I was the lion who forced you to join with Erebus. I was the cat who comforted you among the houses of the dead. I was the lion who drove the jackals from you while you slept. I was the lion who gave the horses the new strength of fear for the last mile so that you should reach King Loon in time. And... I was the lion that you do not remember, who pushed the boat in which you lay, a child near death, so that it came to shore where a fisherman sat, wakeful at night to receive you. Who are you? asked Shasta. Myself, said the voice. Maybe, like Shasta, we see our lives as a series of trials, a series of tragedies. God seems loveless and absent. But friends, like, like Shasta with Aslan, God has been caring for you and loving you all along the way, even when you can't see it, even when you blame him. If you hear only one thing today, hear this. God loves you relentlessly. Even when you can't see him, even when you accuse him, even when you hate him, God loves you relentlessly. And he proves it by letting you come to him with your accusations because he longs to be with you no matter what. I don't know where you are today in your relationship with God, but do you need to lean into God with anger? Do you need to lean into God with malaise? Do you need to lean into God with blame? Do you need to lean into God with joy? Do you need to lean into God with despair? Do it. Lean forward into God with your doubts, with your anger, with your joy, with your disappointment, because he loves being with you no matter what. 
And so the question remains, how are you leaning forward into God's loving presence? No matter how, God welcomes it because he loves you relentlessly. Amen.